Today I'll be talking about codependency and um, I'll be reading from my notes from Melody Beattie's book, Codependent No More. So first of all, I'm going to talk about an open versus closed system, which is love is the open system, addiction is a closed system. So one-sided addiction you'll, is like the closed um, system. And that's where we have denial, fantasy, overestimation of the other's commitment, and it seeks solutions outside the self. This could be a new lover, changing the situation, alcohol, drugs. Love is that there's room to grow, expand, desire for others too, and um, to, to others to also grow. When we have addiction, it's dependent based on security and comfort. We use intensity of need and infatuation as proof of my love. It may really be a fear, an insecurity, or loneliness. Love, you have separate interests, other friends, maintain other meaningful relationships. Addiction is total involvement, limited social life, and neglecting old friends and interests. Love is encouragement of each other's expanding. Each one is secure in, in, their own, in our own worth like as individuals. Versus addiction is preoccupation with each other's behavior, dependent on the other's approval for our identity and self-worth. Love is trust and openness. Um, mutual integrity is preserved. Versus in addiction, you would have jealousy, possessiveness, protecting the supply, kind of, um, fearing competition, and one partner's need, they're suspended for the other, which is considered self-deprivation. In love, you have willingness to, to risk and be real as yourself. And addiction would be searching for the perfect invulnerability, which eliminates any possible risk. Um, love would be room for exploration of feelings in and out of the relationship. Addiction is reassurance through repeatedly, ritualized, repeatedly engaging in ritualized activity. Love is the ability to enjoy being alone and even to accept a breakup without feeling a loss of our own adequacy and self-worth. Addiction is intolerance, and it's an inability to endure separations even in conflict, hanging on even tighter, and undergoing a sense of withdrawal, which is disoriented agony, restlessness, lethargy, loss of appetite. It's feeling inadequate, worthless, and it's like feeling like the, even the separation is like a one-sided decision. Love wants the best for the partner, even when apart, we can be friends. Addiction is like a violent ending. Often we hate each other, we try to inflict pain, we use manipulation to get each other back. Now, how do we move from love to addiction? Because a lot of people identify with pieces of this on either side. You say, well, I thought that this was a real relationship. It sounds like we might have some addiction here. So the activity is at least once a day check in asking ourselves what is needed for the sake of care um, and do what's needed or give what's needed. So what does that do? That gives us a chance to take a deep breath or to pause and to do prevention better than the cure. Now even if someone's really struggling, like for example if I had a rough night, then I might do it every hour or even every few minutes. It depends on the level of crisis. And then what's needed from people around me is, is how we identify like an appropriate time to sit with them and ask in a way that models this self-care practice, taking pauses. So William Shakespeare, William Shakespeare says, this above all, to thine own self be true and it must follow as the night the day thou canst not then be false to any man. So real love requires us to be real, right? Um, another activity, which um, I'm not going to—I'm not doing these as prompts because I'm speaking about these topics a lot. But I would say, you know, some activities that she recommends—you know, she has many activities. I'm choosing these, but is how do I feel about myself? And perhaps I'll do this as a prompt in the future. And it would be like and dislike. And another is to review grief and personal process. I actually did this as a prompt at some point where I said, what's my personal relationship with grief? And I suggested that others try it, but it's like, we get to see how each time someone lets us down, it's a type of grief. Now, I'm gonna go through some myths. 
myths um, that could lead to addiction. So when we let go of these myths, we could be real and we have to mature. First of all, it's, oh, it's not, these myths are all not true. So I'm saying these are things that you could identify could lead to addiction if there isn't already an addictive element. So these are some of them. It's not okay to feel angry. Anger is a waste of time and energy. Good or nice people don't get feel angry. We shouldn't feel angry when we do. We'll lose control or go crazy if we get angry. People will go away if we get angry with them. Other people should never feel anger toward us. If others get angry with us, we must have done something wrong. If others are angry with us, we made them feel it and are responsible for fixing their feelings. If we feel angry, someone made us feel that way and that person is responsible for fixing our feelings. If we feel angry with someone, the relationship is over, that person has to go away. If we feel angry, we should punish that person for making us feel angry. If we feel angry, we have to hit someone or shout or holler or break something. If we feel angry, the person has to change what he or she is doing so we don't feel angry anymore. If we feel angry with someone, it means that the other person, um, that we don't love the other person. Or if someone's angry with us, it means, you know, that they don't love us. Anger is a sin. And the final myth is that it's okay to feel angry only when we can justify our feelings. So, obviously, there's um, an element here of avoiding anger, which is hurt. Anger is disappointment, is grief. Why do we become addicts, for example, codependent, or in any way dependent, is when we're trying to feel better. So, let's talk about dealing with anger. Still, Melody Beattie responsible for a lot of these, um, you know, I, it's, a, it's a big book. I recommend some, you know, someone who feels it would be helpful to learn more about these topics to go read. Um, but I'm sharing what I think is most important for, um, for these topics of interest. So dealing with anger that's new or old. These are some tips. Address any myths we've subscribed to about anger. In other words, what, we, what I just read that list, give permission to feel angry when we need to and others too feel our feelings feel the emotion it's not right or wrong it's energy and motion and has underlying emotions too it doesn't need justice justification judgment or rationalization it is acknowledge which thoughts go along with these feelings for example now pin the myths to the feelings about anger when we feel guilt and shame about anger we become more addictive we have to examine these thinking that goes with the feelings so we have to see which patterns and repetitions we have to make a responsible decision about what or if any actions need to be taken and figure out what it's telling us versus like is the pro like versus seeing problems. So listen for information rather than a problem. In other words, a responsible decision means I could respond. I'm able to respond. If there's a problem I cannot respond to because there's a problem then we have to figure out like what's the information telling us so that there could be a possible solution. Is it something I need to look at that needs to be changed? Is there something I need from someone? Do I need to care for myself more? Is there, is there something in the environment or in myself that I could look at as a problem that needs to be solved that you know I could figure out where what needs to be revealed? In other words, don't let anger control us. We have to be able to solve the issues. Now, when we're in problem state, we're not able to really solve the problem. It's only when we're in a creative or open mindset that we can actually come up with ideas that are relevant because we can see the bigger picture rather than when we're stuck in that one minute crisis. So we have to get peaceful. We have to move, you know, going for a walk or take a few deep breaths, listen to a meditation. We have to get safe because the anger can make us think we're not safe. That's why we have all these ideas about anger being wrong or sinful. We have to be free of fear of anger. In other words, we have to get comfortable with anger. Even just saying anger so many times, it makes me feel a lot. Um, we have to start openly and honestly discussing our anger when appropriate. A few ways to approach um, well, first of all, we just have to be weary of, uh, be aware of our approach. A few ways to approach is not to vent the rage, rather be in the experience as a feeler, as someone who's feeling these feelings and thinking, and a thinker and thinking thoughts. And in that moment, we listen to our feelings and thoughts about what we need to express by going back to him or her 
once we have that information available. So it's a personal process first. And we can take responsibility for our own anger instead of blaming the other person because it is my feelings and my thoughts. If I want to actually work with it, it has to be in me, right? We talk about how addiction is outside solution because there's problems versus when we're in self-care, we already know we're going to solve the problem that we're not focusing on the problem. We trust we have all the tools because the anger is a messenger. The anger is telling us something's wrong. Something's happening that shouldn't be happening. And we have to figure out what that is and how, you know, perhaps we are thinking in shoulds and that's why we're getting stuck in rationalizing even. Finally, talk to people we trust because being listened to and accepted, in other words, like just having our feelings and thoughts be valid for the moment helps clarity and to feel cared about and to understand ourselves. And then we're not looking to the person who made us, I'm adding this personal view is that we're not going to start looking to the person who made us angry to start respecting us and taking care of us in the moment when we're so resentful. Um, another topic here which um, I'll share is that thoughts are key to feelings. Feelings are key to thoughts. So as I've been saying, we're a thinker, we're a feeler, so our thoughts bring in feelings and our feelings bring in thoughts. So from a place of like, I think I was wronged and feelings of self-pity come, then feelings of anger come because you hurt, you made me feel bad and then shame comes because I don't want to be an angry person and then thoughts come that I'll never be loved because I got angry again. And um, so as we follow this through, we recognize actually we have to let these thoughts pass, these feelings. We're learning from them. We need to treat our mind to peace, consistency enough time for certainty we have to ask we have to ask God to help us think and we have to recognize that when we're constantly obsessing and worrying we're actually abusing our mind our mind is this creative tool and then we get stuck in the problem we're abusing our own mind and then we might um, shame others for this worry and obsession rather than just being a healthy um, validator when others are angry, right? We, and then we need to feed our mind information that's helpful and relevant um, in an appropriate amount. In other words, we have to um, feed our mind healthy thoughts. In other words, we have to indulge. I keep saying in other words. There's a theme here. We got to feed the mind. So I'm talking here about addiction, right? We're looking to feed our mind with a hit, like a mini power struggle with the lover in codependency. So actually what we're doing is we're taking responsibility. We're feeding our mind information so that it's not trying to figure someone else out, figure the situation out. We need to like um, read books, talk to people, for example, but we need to get helpful, relevant information and an appropriate amount. The mind needs to be fed solution um, solution states, things that bring about solution states. And in other words, and that's why I say, in other words, we need to feed our mind healthy thoughts. So indulging in activities that uplift us into that positive charge where we move from I can't to I can. And ways that we can stretch our mind, which are very healthy. And these are ways that lessen anger because we start to be a little more subtle because we have the space and the time are things like discovering, exploring, learning, reading. We're not so controlling then because we come across a lot of risks and things that are unpredictable. We don't get as angry as often because we can transfer that in all areas of our life to cope with adapting. We have to quit saying bad things about our mind, which is what doubts is, is that I won't be able or I can't, I'm too stupid or I can't figure it out or I'm going to make the same mistake or, you know, and then we have to use our mind this mind with making decisions, we have opinions, express, create, think things through, choose for ourselves, self-care, gain confidence by letting others do for themselves too and be responsible and grow and, and others around are allowed to grow. They have to make their own mistakes and make their own choices and have consequences. And we can um, really take this a step further and turn everything into a goal. Um, we can have realizations kind of constantly. 
we can be constantly realizing. And so we don't have to keep like realizing a love with the other person. If we're in relationship, travel, experience, changing in appearance, new or specific, um, possessions, a certain income, career, spiritual practices, attaining a trait or shedding a trait. In this, in this context of like going towards something in the future, we do stop obsessing. We do stop doubting. Just by nature of this forward momentum, we stop abusing our mind. And we need God to help us think. We say, God, help me. This is all new. But we're not as afraid because it's not a new, same old thing again. It's not a new time that we're in the same old problem. In this way, we omit the shoulds, which limit us. And instead, we go for all of it without trying to portion control, which will happen as per natural and supernatural pathways automatically. A way to cope is to write things down and commit them if goals are very hard. So we focus, we organize, and we become non-attached. We let go of the outcome by taking baby steps, um, by doing what can be done, recognizing it's a process. We just keep going. We don't constantly measure. We acknowledge and accredit the goals that we do reach, but also we accept disappointment because that's part of this releasing the attachment to anger. And it, and, and, it, and, and it can happen that we get disappointed if we expected the accomplishment for ourselves or for the other. Um, you know, even if it's something like in the context of codependency that we like expected them to react a certain way or to be taking care of us. And so we want it to be worth the work. And sometimes it could be magical thinking that we keep doing something that doesn't lead to results that we want. So I will, um, because I won't be doing a video on Monday or Tuesday because of the holiday, I'll, I'll do a little more now. I'll continue. There's 12 steps to healing all types of addictions. And this is in the context of codependency. So again, from LABD's book. So, and there is an organization called Codependence Anonymous, um, which I've attended some meetings in the past and I do recommend it to anyone who needs it. So first of all, we admit powerlessness and stop trying to force the impossible. And the reason I'm continuing with the steps after talking about magical thinking is because we also call that delusion, right? When we are in our beliefs instead of what's real. And like William Shakespeare said, if you're true to yourself, you're real, you won't be fake to anyone. So anyway, one, admit powerlessness and stop trying to force the impossible. Start humbly living in possibility that's within our own power. Two, we come to, excuse me, believe in a power greater than self that can restore us to sanity. Three, we made the decision to turn our will and our life over to the care of the power as we understand it. This is a lot taken into account. This is our needs, our wants, our desires, abilities, thoughts, and feelings. We're here to live as long as we're alive. And there's a life for each of us to live. Four, we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves, what we're working with, how we've been affected, what we're doing, what our characteristics are. And we do this in the attitude of love, um, of honesty, of self-care. It's a gentle way to let these things out and confront them. And then we don't feed into self-hate or this, this earning of guilt or, you know, self-castigation, which has been responsible for so much of the problems. We feel low about ourselves, so we continue doing things that make us feel low about ourselves. It's like the external manifest the internal. We have to examine good qualities, our hurts, also our anger, our roles, standards, values. Um, we admitted to God, our, number five, we admit to God ourselves and another human the exact nature of our wrongs. It's like telling on ourselves we no longer have to hide. And we really have to trust a skilled and trustworthy listener to share with um, because this is for healing. This is liberating us from our woundedness. This is forgiveness. Self-forgiveness first. Six. We're entirely ready to have the higher power remove all these defects of character. For example, in this context, it would be low self-worth. Realizing some of our self-protection is harming ourselves and others, and we're ready to take the risk. We release the outdated behaviors and attitudes. We're willing to change and cooperate with, with change. Um, number seven, we humbly ask a higher power to remove our shortcomings. Eight, we made a list of all the persons we've harmed and become willing to make amends to them all. We cultivate the willingness because doing this relieves the guilt 
that plagues us, that causes us to obsess, worry, doubt, and try to change someone else beyond, you know, the self. Nine, we may direct amends to such people wherever possible, except where to do so would injure them or others. And ten, we continue to take personal inventory when we were wrong and promptly admitted it. This is the idea of don't let guilt add up. Act, don't let it add up at all. It's like when there's garbage, literally spilled milk. There's some spilled milk. And you're going to leave it there. And then the next day, it gets kind of stinky. And the next day, it gets worse. And then you spill some more milk because there's already milk. And now you have all the spilled milk. And you're not crying over the spilled milk until you are crying over the spilled milk because it stinks. So don't let it add up. Clean it right away. Cleaning it means get it out. Get out the guilt. So we have to keep our eyes on ourselves. It's continual self-evaluation and figure out what we like about ourselves and what we've done right and good. And figure out what we don't like and what we've been doing um, you know, and, and, but we accept ourselves. We take care of ourselves. We don't hate ourselves. We even self congratulate. We feel proud of ourselves. We, we give gratitude to the higher power for the opportunities. And we learn how to say, I'm wrong. I'm sorry. 11. We sought through prayer and meditation to improve consciousness with our higher power as we understand, praying only for knowledge of higher power's will and the power to carry it out. We learn the difference between humility, um, like I was going to say humiliation and humility. But here I mean rumination and meditation. So like being open and receptive is a type of humble like meditation versus ruminating like chewing on something and not being receptive but like kind of like making ourselves feel bad. We decide whether we see God as benevolent. Got to face it at some point. Is God loving you and taking care of you even though you feel like you're not loved enough by the person that you want to make love you the right way? Um, or I'll speak in I. Um, does God love me if God is giving me somebody who I feel like I have to control? You know, so we, we see if we believe that God knows where we live. <laughs> like, can you find me here? Do you know where I am? Are you able to love me here now? Um, we get quiet, we detach, we pray, we ask what's wanted of me. We say, like, you know, humbly, like, and we ask for the power to do it. Like, I want to do what's meant for me. I don't want God to do what I want. I want to do what I'm supposed to do. We let go, we watch. These are all skills, right? It's practices. We trust um, the guardianship of our higher power. We become sensitive to how the higher power works through us. And having had a spiritual awakening at number 12, as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to others and practice these principles in all our affairs. So this is what spirituality is versus religion because it's awakening, it's care for the spirit, it's loving self and others. It's not just the outside practice it's a inner it's, it's giving up being rescued or rescuing um it's not it's turning our life into light and shining it and it's applying this to all other parts of our life um however working the steps and going to coda meetings and so on is great but you need to seek professional help if and i have professional help i have a therapist um you know if you have depression um suicidality, you want to do an intervention for a, an addict or a troubled person, or a, um, you're a victim of six, physical or sexual abuse, or you're physically or sexually abusing someone else, or you can't solve your problems because you feel stuck in them and your mind doesn't have enough healthy thoughts or you don't even know where to get healthy thoughts from, um, and you're experiencing problems with substances, like beyond, like every time the person doesn't do what you want, you go and smoke a cigarette, which I am guilty of in the past. Um, not even too long ago, and um, or a joint, or alcohol, right? Or you just go get professional help if you believe you need it. So progression of a codependent personality um, is like, she's getting a lot of this from fat is a family affair. So the early stages is often born were, is, is the early stages is often the person is born from a dysfunctional family and learn to care for others as a measure of self worth. Fail to care to cure the parents, so we'll try to cure the the other person who's an over under consumer or something else like an eater. Like I said, she got this from fat as a family affair. So I'll say consumer. Um, you know, it could be a consumer of attention. Con like we basically fill in the blank for somebody who's consuming too much or too little. They're hiding from attention, so we keep bombarding them, or they want so much attention, so we run away. These kind of, we've all probably been exposed to this anxious avoidance patterns and codependent um, types of interactions, but 
a lot of times there's other things going on here. We're trying to control someone maybe because they're, like today I was very upset with somebody for eating Oreos and soda when there was a bunch of healthy food around because they went out of their way to, they didn't even have the money for it. They went out of their way to ask somebody for the money to go get it. Um, and it's like, it really brought out in me this desire to control and I acted in a way that I wasn't proud of because I was trying to get it to not happen. So this idea of like um, finding an over, okay, so then this, the early stages is like the progression. So this, this person, right, will, will try, to cure, try to cure this over under consumer, finds an over under consumer who is so ne who's needy and so controls and begins doubting own perceptions and wants to control um, consuming to show decisiveness. So social life is affected, isolated from community to help uh, this over the consumer. Obsession is makes plans and threats relating to the consuming behavior, judges self and feels the cause of the let's say it's eating or starving, overeating or starving or consuming or um, abstaining, hiding things, hiding the substances if it's available, if it's applicable, um, attempts to control the other person's behaviors makes nagging, scolding, threats, shows anger and disappointment regarding the other person's promises. There's a secret life here, um, which is like becoming obsessed with watching and covering up, takes over responsibilities of the other person, takes pivotal role in communications, excludes the, the contact between the person and others, and expresses anger inappropriately. Out of control, right? It makes violent con attempts to control the consuming, um, fights with the consumer, lets the self go physically or mentally, and has ex either um, even workaholism, um, obsession with outside interests, related illness, drug abuse, ulcers, rashes, migraines, depression, obesity, tranquilizing the self, extramarital fear such as infidelity, becomes rigid and possessive, angry most of the time, and secretive about home life, constantly loses temper, and becomes sick and tired of being sick and tired. Um, adult children of addicts and narcissists or troubled people often feel isolated, afraid of people, especially authority, and observe oneself to be an approval seeker, losing our identity. We feel overly frightened of angry people and personal criticism. We often feel like a victim in um, career or personal relationships, and we feel an overdeveloped sense of responsibility, which makes it easier to be concerned with others rather than ourselves finding it hard to look at my own faults and my responsibility to myself and getting guilty feelings when I stand up for myself instead of giving, instead of giving in to others. Um, feeling addicted to excitement, confusing love with pity, loving people that I can pity and rescue, judging myself harshly, in other words, having low self-esteem, tending to be a reactor instead of an actor, often feeling abandoned in the course of the relationships and tending to fight it hard to express feelings, including joy and happiness. Now, when it comes to relating, there's got to be a detachment there, a non-rescuing approach to people, paying attention to the self, working our own reprogramming, practicing, becoming undependent, right? We don't say independent, we say undependent. Balance um, in this way is like, okay, so we choose and behave with initiating, maintaining, and discontinuing relationships. Good things can and will happen if we allow it. We connect with freedom to goals and dreams. We face newness. How do I say this? We face newness that are, is part of growth. There's, there's newness in the struggle. So we face the newness in the struggle instead of automatically shutting down. That's a way of relating. So balance would mean passive or active and give and receive. So we find balance, actually. And I'm going to stop there. Um, thank you for spending time with me. This holiday is called Sukkot. It's eight days. Um, the first few days are the Yom Tov, where I won't use the... Um, electronics to make a video and upload it but um, in a few days we have the intermediate days and I'll be able to God willing so I wish you happy holiday it's relevant and um, be well